Uh, so we have a question from Fahim. Is there a registration form or something so others can fill in their details? Yes, actually we do. Uh, Nimasha, can you share the uh, link to the registration so we can keep everyone informed uh, uh, about future events like this? Yeah, I agree. Uh, if you can uh, type in your email, uh, anyone who would like to keep in touch, we can add you to uh, our uh, subscription list. Let me share the uh, form real quick. Okay, um, so the link I'm sharing right now, um, uh, you can uh, fill in your details into the form and uh, we will include you uh, into our database. Thank you everyone for the interest. Okay, um, shall we get started Mewan? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Rishvi Jayatilaka. I'm one of the co-founders for Slick. Um, and thank you for making time to be here. Um, this will be the first webinar session uh, for our series. Um, and today we have Professor A.P. De Silva to talk about essential steps to a successful research publication. Um, so if you have any questions during the session, please do type in uh, your question in the chat box uh, and I will uh, forward it to the professor during uh, our discussion. Um, going into the next slide. So this will be the outline for the talk today. Um, and let me start with a brief introduction to Slake. Um, Slake or uh, Sri Lankan American Knowledge Exchange uh, is an organization that was started last year um, by myself and Nimasha. Um, so the main motivation why we started this organization is to create a platform for researchers uh, in Sri Lanka and in, in the United States to connect and collaborate uh, and to uh, promote sharing of knowledge. Um, our long-term vision is to mitigate the impacts of brain drain uh, through these collaborations um, and connections. Um, so, so far uh, we've been uh, getting so much of support uh, from researchers, students, faculty members from both the countries. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the current activities done by Slake. Uh, the webinar series is one of the latest initiatives that we started. Uh, where we will introduce a Sri Lankan researcher and uh, talk about different topics. And we would like to engage students from Sri Lanka and in the US or, or all around the world, so to speak, as much as we can. Um, we also have an initiative called the Publication Repository. Um, and this is actually led by our secretary, Marsha, where we uh, showcase publications by Sri Lankan authors um, with the intention to increase the exposure and uh, the visibility of publications. Um, currently, we are also working on developing a database where our researchers can connect with each other one, once it's fully functional. Um, and the nice thing about this is uh, we are actually giving an opportunity to a student in Sri Lanka uh, to develop the database in collaboration with a, professor, with a professor at University of Maryland in the US. So if anyone is interested uh, and have ex expertise in database building, please do reach out to us. We are still in the process of interviewing uh, students. Um, and uh, the other main thing that we do is we catalyze connections um, based on the connection request uh, we get. So, so far we've been able to establish around 23 connections uh, for research collaborations. 
Um, we also have a research spotlight where we feature uh, a Sri Lankan researcher every month. Um, so like I said, please do subscribe and uh, fill in your details in the link I just shared. Uh, because we send out this newsletter every month, so you can stay connected and uh, you can learn about more opportunities uh, that will be really useful as students and researchers. Um, so let me uh, get started with the most important part of the talk today. Uh, I would like to welcome our guest speaker for the day, uh, Professor A.P. De Silva. Um, He's an alumnus of University of Colombo, so am I. And I'm thrilled to have him here today as the first speaker for our webinar series. Um, thank you so much, sir, for making thank the time you. today. Thank you all for making the time. Um, so he's currently the chair in organic chemistry at Queen's University in Belfast, Ireland. Um, he does research, very interesting research in photochemistry and uh, make these breakthrough innovations time to time. And uh, he's a world renowned scientist and we are really honored to have him here today. Um, so today, uh, the moderator for the discussion will be Mevan Disanayake. He's a chemistry uh, postdoctoral research associate at Rochester University. Um, okay, over to you, Mevan. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rishi, for the initiative and also uh, Professor A.P. De Silva. I'm privileged to moderate this session with you. Uh, so uh, to start uh, the discussion at the very outset, would you give an overview of uh, the research that's been going on in your lab and uh, the in impact that it has made so far? Uh, thank you, Mevan. And Thank you very much, Rishvi and Nimasha, for organizing this. And thanks to all of you who have joined us online. I realize all of us have things to do in our lives. So you put the time aside for this, which, for which I'm very grateful. Because this is a lovely organization and a lovely initiative. So congratulations again, Rishvi and Nimasha, for doing this. And Mevan, obviously, you are involved as well. Uh, yes, just by way of a summary, uh, I'm very happy to say that I started out in the University of Colombo as a student and also was very fortunate to spend some time teaching at the University of Colombo as well. And uh, some of the research that I still do uh, started out there, which I'm very happy to say, and I hope it makes many of you happy as well. And hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of those features during this time we have together. Uh, the research I do now is basically concerned with how molecules handle information. Molecules handling information, a bit like how we handle information. We get information from various sources. We might read it in a book or on a website, but then we put it into our head and then out comes some kind of action. And that action might help our lives to become happier or other people's lives to become happier. So we handle information all the time. And if we didn't handle information, we will be dead. So because of that, information handling is very crucial to living besides modern technologies. So it was important, therefore, to try and make molecules handle information also. And remembering that we are molecular species, finally, finally. And so that is the topic I do. And... Uh, so there are two sides to that question, handling information. One is to gather information, to take information that is there in the world somewhere, maybe inside ourselves, and then to get that information in a form that other people can be influenced by it. And then the second part is to process the information, to get the information from somewhere in the world and then put it into our little molecule. And just like we will think and develop an idea, molecules also can do this. And then to put something out from there, which can be useful to people. And as we discuss, we can see examples of this. And I'm again, very happy to say, University of Colombo was where, of course, a long time ago, about 40 years ago, was where we started this field. We didn't think of it that way at the time, but of gathering information or what is now called sensors, molecules which are sensitive to their surroundings. 
and those surroundings can be within ourselves or can be outside. And so because of that, these molecules can gather information from one place and give it to somebody else to use as they wish. And then the second field, which did not start in the University of Colombo, but the seeds were planted in the University of Colombo, again, for which I'm very grateful, which is for processing information, where molecules actually like, think, or show intelligence. And so that is the field of molecular logic and computation. And that field was, I'm happy to say, started in Belfast by us, the field, but the origin of the field came from friends in the University of Colombo. Okay, so that's what I do. Yeah, that's great to hear, sir. So in your journey of studying how molecules handle information, how have publications been important to you? And moving further on that question, like uh, from, the per from the perspective of an undergraduate, uh, how would the publications be important to them? Yes, very valuable point to discuss. Uh, publications, as we all know, the word says something available to the public. And science research must be available to the public uh, because various reasons. But one of the reasons is that uh, many times to do research, uh, there will be organizations will invest in the university or invest in those people to offer some funding, though I must say sometimes we work with zero funding, but still there are the institutions which create investment by having the facilities and the environment in which we do research. And that is a gift to the researcher. And then the researcher may be like any one of us listening, we may have a lovely idea, but then that has to be tested. In science, as we know, science is where the knowledge is genuinely useful to other people, which means once we do a discovery or we make an invention, it has to be tested by others. Otherwise, it's just a dream in my head, which is of no use to anybody else. So one part of a publication is to show our work to other people who can examine it critically, who can say, I don't believe that guy De Silva. I'm going to check what he's done. Sorry for any other De Silva's listening. But so then it is to say a healthy skepticism, not to believe everything that is done. So then in science, that checking is really important. And that checking is a reason for publishing because then any member of the public, if they are interested, they should be able to check that. That's one. But the other part of it, you might say that is like a negative reason, but there's a very positive reason as well. The positive reason is once something is checked, it is genuinely now useful to other people. And then other people can incorporate that in their thinking and living, both. Uh, so thinking is usually the starting point. And later, maybe I can illustrate a case of where it impacts living. And so if that happens, then the science is truly published because now it's in the hands of the public, who some of who have checked whether it's useful. And now in other people's hands, it's helping their thinking and it's helping their living continuously. So then comes this question of what are the other uses of publication? The, and especially like from undergraduate point of view. Then the reasons there become, if you have a publication, other people get to connect you as a person with the discovery. As we know in science, generally the idea is impersonal. It has to be outside of the person. That is something quite important when we compare science with arts, for example. Like arts is equally important, but arts is very personal. Like the way one musician plays an instrument is different from the way another person will play that instrument. Whereas in science, if it is genuinely science, it has to be something that is equally valid in the hands of anybody. So this is a real strength. And so that is one reason when a, as an undergraduate, if you participate in a publication, that is really crucial because people all over the world, if only they had the interest, and at any point in time, it may be 30 years later, 
you are no longer an undergraduate, but somebody will connect you with that paper. And if then it helped to save that person's life or got involved in some way, then that person will be thankful to you. Or in the old way, we would say in Sri Lanka, that person will give you some merit in some description. So that is one. And the other description, of course, of being connected with your publication is that it can help you with reputation that suddenly that person will be saying, oh, Mevan Disanayaka is the person who gave this idea to the world. So from that moment on, it's connected with Disanayaka. Like we will say Einstein or someone in the past, and that is the right of any other person. And so that builds a reputation. So there's always the connection. If somebody hears the name Disanayaka, they will say, oh, that's the guy who did that environmental organic chemistry, didn't he? That idea. And then that leads to something further. It helps the career of that person, this Anaka. Because then people will say, oh yeah, this person has a reputation. And if the person has a reputation, we must reward this person. Maybe compensate with a higher salary in the institution or change to another institution. And suddenly you're like Rishvi working in Intel, that idea. So those are the sequence of events which can happen from undergraduate time or I've even heard of high school people joining in publications and it can help them throughout their lives. Thank you, Professor. So uh, moving on to uh, uh, starting off uh, research, uh, uh, aiming for a publication. So uh, what aspects do you think one should consider in identifying uh, research problems and also collecting credible data and analysis uh, in order to uh, produce a story for a publication. Yes, Mevan, I think that is a very uh, reasonable way, a rational way to do a discussion about a research publication. Um, and if I could ask Nimasha, Nimasha, could you please share the Daya Siri Rupa Singha publication with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nimasha. So please allow me uh, for all the viewers and listeners to take this as an example to discuss the question that Mevan has put to us. Like how we look for a problem and how we then develop that problem to the point of a publication. So this is a piece of work, as you can see, it's from the University of Colombo post box 1490. So I have shown this to many, many friends around the world and be very happy to share it with them. Uh, and to say that here is how we were able to do something uh, in a small situation where, which, where Sri Lanka was in 1985. So to answer the question that Mevan put to us there, like how we choose a problem. So like, and I especially thought I will show you this at this point because pH indicators are things that all of us have met. All of us have met. And not only those of us listening today, but anyone who has done high school chemistry. So it is to show how we can start with something very innocent and very humble and very simple, you would say, and try to find a new line of research from it. Now, I have to confess, at that time, I, I didn't do it as rationally as it might seem. But some of the thoughts were certainly in my head, was that uh, in the University of Columbia at that time, we had limited resources, you might say. But one of the resources we had a lot of was very motivated people. And I would offer it to you that that is a resource. A resource is not only an instrument. A resource is not only a library with good books and web access to journals. One of the most important resources is having people with uh, clear minds, which have been prepared well for a long time and who are willing with a smile on their faces to struggle with a problem because uh, a problem is that. A problem is something to which there is no answer. So a problem, initially, there is no answer. And so then it should cause us difficulty. And not everyone is humanly prepared to handle problems. 
So that's why they take other jobs. Uh, but in science, then we are taking on a problem and saying, I think I can find a solution to this problem. And so very much like Mevan mentioned there, how do we choose the problem? So in my case here, it was pH indicators are something we all know. And then as another thing we can touch on here, in a field of research, we must be aware in some way of what are the extents of that field of research. And that comes by reading. So we, each one of us has to read. As an undergraduate, we read. As an old guy like me, I read. We have to finally read and gather information about that topic which we like. So pH indicators is something we all know. And we have all seen the color changes and so on. And, and as you know, in Sri Lanka, many times you would have had a drink made out of a juice of a flower and you put a bit of lime and it changes color. And Archie did that for me. And so I remember that. And so pH indicators were something that is in the front of all our heads as chemists. And so at that time I thought a bit about, can I make pH indicators which are new? And here again, it touches on what Mevan mentioned. There are hundreds and hundreds of pH indicators known. So maybe I can make the next one. But that won't be new in a conceptual sense. In a lot of research publications, especially if you are looking for publications which are highly regarded, we, we can discuss that later, Mevan. Uh, to do that, there must be something new in concept. As you know, concept is where something is born, especially as an idea. So this is an important part of choosing a problem, I think. To try and think. So reading and thinking come very closely connected. And if we are willing to think and say there are lots of pH indicators known. And then uh, the slow realization came to me that uh, pH indicators, which are known like phenolphthalene, methyl orange, and there are many others we would have used with our own hands, huh? all of us. And so then it was fairly easy to see after a while, if we look at the molecular structures that are known, that they are all related very closely. So almost all these hundreds and hundreds of pH indicators known until that time in the 1980s were all based on one design. And so then there was a chance for me to slowly feel, ah, can we do a different design? So it's a bit like a lady goes into a shop and says, oh, there is a lovely dress. And then says, no, I like a flower here on the sleeve. Oh, and that will change the design. And suddenly, it will suddenly be the Rishvi design. And then suddenly you're selling it like Jean-Paul Gaultier or some of the big designs. And so in the same way in chemistry also, we can make design changes. And I was very fortunate at that time to come across this principle in photochemistry, which I had learned for my PhD called photo-induced electron transfer, which was only starting at the time, started out in Germany. And then I saw a possibility to connect it with pH indicators. So that's a conceptual development. You take one idea or one field in one place of chemistry, then you go to another part of chemistry or you can go to another part of science or to another part of knowledge and then you make like a arranged marriages and you are like the matchmaker now between two very different families you would say and then you will get the best genes in the children for example and so that is what we were able to do and Daya Sigri Rupa Singh helped me greatly on this because he had the energy he had the interest and we were able to use uh, whatever instrumental facilities we had. But most importantly, we had the enthusiasm, especially in the Azari at the time. And then we were able to connect these molecules, which you see in the structures, if you like, in the, uh, the frame down below on the right hand side. So these were a new way. And as you see, even in the title, a new class of pH indicators, which are fluorescent. So these are these bright indicators which shine almost in the dark. And so this was the example of finding a research problem. And I maybe mentioned as Mevan talked about choosing the problem, I chose a problem which all of us knew a little at least. 
So it will then attract attention, not only of myself, but of other people. When you say pH indicator, they will all say, ah, oh, yeah, I know that. And then it is going to be a new class, not a new pH indicator, but a new class. And is based on something which might surprise a lot of people. At that time, it surprised a lot of people. Photo-induced electron transfer that is involved in photosynthesis in plants. And so now suddenly we are making a connection from photosynthesis to pH indicators, which uh, we thought at the time was the first case in the world. And later it turned out it was not because um, we, we had chemical abstracts in University of Colombo at the time. But it's a big job to read through the discussions that were in the literature at the time. So I think we were about number four or five. But then later, we, I was able to generalize it with other friends and show that you don't only can do pH indicators, you can do indicators for various other things, basically anything you care to think of. Of course, then we so did it, slowly did it. Again, if I can, it, Nimasha, can you please show Salia de Silva's paper? Salia de Silva's. It's there. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So this was in the following year, 1986, that we did this. Uh, and so in this one, it's very similar. I'm sure some of you who are looking at these slides with us now will notice that if you look at the bottom right hand side, the structure, I have three benzene rings in a row, anthracene, which we study for university undergraduate. You saw the same thing in the previous one. So this was to show, now the title of the slide may be different. So I had matured a bit in that year. So called it signaling crown ethers. And crown ethers is that big ring you see in the bottom right hand. Five oxygens and one nitrogen there. It's like a crown on a head. And at that time, it was soon after a Nobel Prize was given for crown ethers. So they were quite popular at the time. And so we were able to now show that you can do alkali metal ion recognition. Mm -hmm. pH indicators look for proton, H plus. Mm -hmm. Now we are looking for K plus and sodium plus. So Salia helped me with this. And so you see how mm -hmm. uh, a simple concept can be developed in stages. Yes, so a quick recap of uh, what you uh, brief professor as I, as I thought would be to read and think about, to identify gaps in knowledge, and then to have an idea about the path to move ahead, uh, especially working on the interface of two disciplines to find out, uh, for, to for carve out a unique story, and then uh, like continue to uh, move in the journey of testing hypotheses. Like I, I, I feel like that's where the persistence comes. Yes. Excellent. I think the way you've summarized this is very fine. If I could just add a little bit to it, like as you very correctly said, to identify a gap or a place where there is something missing, especially if you can identify a gap, which is a boundary, a boundary. Because as you know, sometimes a gap is between two stones, say you have a small gap in the middle, or sometimes you will find that is the last stone. After that, there is only water. And then you really need, uh, in fact, this was explained to me by a Nobel Prize winner, and I'm really happy to share it with you. One of the things he said is, uh, he said, you must look for the horizon. You must look to the horizon because that is vision. At that time, I didn't know. And I told him, do I need glasses? And he says, I, I do use glasses. But he said, no, no, the meaning of vision is to look around a corner or to look over the horizon. So it means everybody is looking in the same direction, but only you are seeing. This was a very powerful idea. And he told it to me long before he got the Nobel Prize. And it was very clear. And then I understood slowly. And so it was... So I think if, as Mevan very rightly said, look for the gap and look for wide gaps if you can. The wider the gap, because then you are probably the only one looking in that direction. Again, like again, to give illustration, like we are standing on the beach in Mount Lavinia, say, 
just for homesickness. And then if you look towards the horizon, you, you are the only person between you and the horizon, unless the boat goes past. So then you have no competition. So then it's easier because sometimes if you, uh, or if any of us go into a field which is very competitive, then sometimes the richest guy wins. But if you're looking towards the horizon where there is no competition, then it doesn't matter how fast you go or how rich you are. It just means you're looking in the direction where nobody is. And so that can sometimes be very beneficial also. Thank you very much for the elaboration, Professor. So uh, once we have moved on, uh, moved on this journey of like uh, testing our hypothesis and then persistently uh, co collecting data that's uh, necessary to, co to produce a story, that yeah, at that point, the journal comes into the scenario, the uh, picture where we have to decide about the journal that we should target to publish and then also build up the story and sort of like to uh, to convince an audience that we are doing some work that is beneficial uh, for the community. So what's your advice on that, uh, Professor? We can certainly discuss it and I can certainly uh, share some of the feelings I would have had over the years because for each person they might have to gather their own advice. But in general, I think you touched on several very crucial elements. The story, as you rightly mentioned, when you have the problem and then, of course, you have to gather the data and the data has to be repeatable. As we talked right at the start, uh, science has to be repeatable. So before somebody else checks you, you must check yourself because then we won't be embarrassed, for example, if we make a mistake. And so that's the first thing. And then, as you rightly said, when you use the word several times, I think there's a really powerful that to have a story and the meaning of the story, as you know, is very much in the way we think of a story in childhood, which is a story must have a beginning. And in the beginning, you have to set the scene, which is like the introduction to a paper. And then the story must progress in a direction. And then the story must have an end. And like real old stories that many of us heard from our grandmothers, or you might think the story must have like a moral at the end. Say, this is what it means for your life. And in science, this is very true. And that will be the conceptual advice. So the story may be about some part of data. So you choose a molecule like in my little situation, I will make a small molecule. Some others will make a material, a polymer or a three-dimensional big structure. I will make a small molecule. And then if I only did that, many people will say, oh, that is just your molecule. I have no interest. But if I can show a moral of that, if I can show a concept of that, then people can say, oh, yeah, now I can take my own molecule. I can take my own material. So it's, it's very much like we learn stories as children. The beginning must be clear. The ending must be clear. And the ending of our little story. And then the meaning of it, which is the bigger story. So if I relate back to that Dayasiri Rupa Singhas and Salia de Silva's cases, the molecule itself is now not important. After 40 years or 35 years, the molecules are forgotten. But those molecules are still cited by people for the general idea. So they will say, so these photo-induced electron transfer sensors, they are called now instead of indicators. And so these PET sensors are widely used, about a thousand labs in the world now. And so they occasionally, not very often now, but they refer back to this old paper. And they will say, oh, here is a paper where this was done a very long time ago. So Mevan, you're very right. The story has to be very clear cut. And then we can naturally now discuss what you meant by the journal and the publication. Of course, now the meaning of publications has changed a lot since the time I did that with Dayasir Rupa Singh and Salya de Silva. At that time, a journal was, and to tell you the situation I faced at the time was, uh, publication was not common. So meaning that we work, we do our work in the university and we are just happy with that. And research was uh, an, an extra. You do it if you like. Because as you know, there are lots of other problems in living. And so you have to do those. And I certainly had my share 
of issues to deal with. And so while doing those, research is an extra. And that is why, again, I want to really congratulate people like Dayasir Rupa Singh and Salih Di Silva. And maybe I'll ask for another paper in a little while, Nimasha. Uh, because then when there are these enthusiastic people with whom we are able to share a dream, you could say, and then we are working towards that same goal, then research happens without uh, effort. The re we had failures, of course, but then the failure was not a stopping thing. It just made us get up and wipe ourselves and start again. And so then we got to an ending and we got the story. So as you said, the story now had a finish. We made a molecule according to some design and now the design is true. So now we are able to tell the story and then tell the moral of the story. Say, ah, by using this photo-induced electron transfer from photosynthesis, now we can use it to tell the full story with this conceptual development. So then we had to think of a journal. But in those days, the only thing I thought of was, and I must confess now, that shows my limited ambition. Uh, for me, it was a job to even get the paper written the first paper was typed by an auntie who had a typewriter because I didn't even have a typewriter. And then the next one, my auntie was too busy and I wrote it by hand. And even now the journal laughs at me. Some of the old editors, they laugh at me and say, we remember getting a handwritten manuscript and they still took it up. Huh? And so I was delighted at the time. And so, so I just sent it to the journal I was used to in my PhD time. So I sent it to the Royal Society of Chemistry, Chemical Communications. Now it's not so powerful. I think the impact factor is about five or six, I think. Uh, at that time, it was one of the few communications journals. That's why it was called Chemical Communications. Uh, that is an important topic now, communications. So. And even at that time, communications was a short paper to say the short story, but the story had to be important. So, of course, I could only tell my auntie to type one or two pages. And so that I was able to do. And we were very grateful that they took the paper and they published it. Nowadays, I think people can be more uh, ruthless about it, you might say. Uh, but for me, that's a bit negative. I think nowadays, I think the ideal way, I think, is to go for a high impact factor journal. Of course, we, we can discuss that. Some people will say that is being ruthless or that is being ambitious. But one of the reasons about going to a high impact factor journal is, of course, then they have to accept it. But going there is they can help, the journal can help to give us good publicity. Now, this is going back to publication. Huh? Because a research publication, even though it is there for the public, most of the public have plenty of things to look at. So they are not going to search for this little paper of mine. But on the other hand, if we go to a high impact journal, part of the reason why they are high impact journals is they go and push the papers. And so at that time, there was not much pushing of the papers, but nevertheless, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Chemical Communications was fairly widely read. And so I think we got some attention and interest. And I must say, those two papers, though I didn't think of it at the time, I did the two papers for pleasure. It was just a happiness to do some research with our friends and then to tell a full story and then to share it with other people. That is why we published those two papers. But what happened to me next, which was a complete surprise. Now, this may not be common for everyone, but it was a case of serendipity. As you know, serendipity is maybe, I think, the most important word that Sri Lanka has given the world. Most important. I'm sorry to say it's not Mevan, it is not Rishi, it is not Nimasha. No, I think those are very important too. But serendipity is the one. Serendipity is the one because it's a word full of hope. It's a word which says accidents will happen to you happily. Happy accidents. And again, I've shared this with many people around the world. And so they say, ah, oh, serendipity comes from Sri Lanka. And this happened to me at the time. These two papers were in the journal. And my old professor, who was not my research advisor, 
he was in Belfast and he saw it and later on I was at that time looking after my Archie in Sri Lanka and then when my Archie passed away there was a phone call to the University of Colombo chemistry department we did not have a telephone and there was this call and it was from my old professor he said uh, I, I seen your papers and I heard your grandmother died do you like to come back and that's what happened to me so but I think that is true in very general terms as we discussed earlier if you have a publication it gives you a reputation and once you give a reputation it can help your career in my case it was accidental but that was a case of selecting a journal and so I chose it innocently I think now people can be much more professional about it and they can choose a high impact factor journal but if you're going to the high impact factor journal you have to be ready for rejection and then I'm sure maybe we can discuss it some more but then if you have a story a full story beginning end and a moral of the story and if the moral of the story has a conceptual advance then we have a good chance to get into a high impact factor journal nowadays it's called impact factor more than about 10 i think so chemical communications won't qualify now i think but there are similar journals like that which come into that category so that is the meaning of having uh, a story and then judging the impact factor of the journal which maybe may one might discuss some more yes sir and uh, yes, yeah, so we, we definitely can uh, dis, uh, discuss further about uh, our tailoring our tailoring the uh, tailoring our writing uh, to fit to a journal of high impact factor. And also, uh, so would you comment on like what common mistakes students make most uh, uh, in writing process? What are the factors that we should be concerned of making up figures and also uh, trying to get data uh, to, to reflect on the story that we are uh, to reflect on the story uh, that we are trying to tell to an audience so on those aspects would you comment on yes that? yes i think those are uh, very well formalized i think you put them in a very nice order on the slide there as well so thanks nimasha uh, yes because when we are approaching a journal uh, it is really nice that the journal at the start might not know us. Later on, there is an advantage. The journal gets to know your reputation. So then there can be benefits. But at the start, it is really ideal in a way, meaning that uh, the, it is very objective or it's one of the most objective things we have. You have written your work as a story. So let us discuss some of the ways in which we have to write our story so that when we go to the journal, the editors and the referees will be able to read your work as an unknown and still notice something valuable in it. And certainly those two papers I showed you earlier, the one with Dasir Rupa Singer and the one with Salia De Silva would have been in that category. I, I had very few publications at the time. And again, to illustrate that, can you please, Nimasha, show the slide with Edwin Photochemistry and Photobiology, please. Thank you, thank you. I am very proud to show you this, maybe even more than the other two for a reason. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, the two previous papers have been cited well and they helped to launch uh, a design which is used in nearly a thousand labs now. This work I'm showing you now has zero citation, zero. Nobody has cited it, not even me, sadly in a way. But I am very proud of this paper. And I want to illustrate again this meaning of having uh, resources which are sometimes unconventional. This is a small paper. I think this journal will have, even now, a very low impact factor, maybe three, four, five, somewhere there. And it's a technical note, as you see in the top there. It is uh, just a bit of sharing a bit of information of technique. So this is not a conceptual advance, but it's a small story. And I'm very proud of this. So for example, uh, 
Next to me, there is Cicero De Silva. Some of you might recognize. He was our head laboratory technician in the University of Colombo. And Edwin, who is next to it, was our glass blowing expert in the University of Colombo. Um, and Ramilal is next. So Ramilal was the head technician soon after that. Lalit Silva is now at the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta. So I'm very proud of this paper because this paper was an example where it's, as I say, it's a very small paper, maybe it's a small story, but I want to share it with you at this point that sometimes we are writing the paper for sheer happiness of having achieved something under very difficult conditions, which other people might not appreciate at all. So this one would not have gone into a high impact journal, but it had a very high impact on me and only me, but, and of course our authors all together. I am really happy with this because this was a case of Cicero and Edwin and Ramilal helping me because they just wanted to. Uh, Lalit was working with me on the project. So we, Lalit and me have to do it for Lalit's bachelor's degree. But the others didn't have to. And they have other things to do. They have to look after the lab. But no, no, but they kindly helped me. And I'm really glad. And again, thanks, Nimasha, for showing that figure on the right. That little instrument there, it looks very ugly drawn by hand by me. But that is a little machine we made. It's a, as you can see in the title of the paper, it's an inexpensive stirring device. So it was made, I can still see it front of my face. We made it with things that were lying around in the lab, broken, unused. And then because of the skill of Edwin to do glass and to bend metal, and then Ramila and Cesar helped me, and we were able to build this device and it actually worked. And so, of course, the reason why it didn't get cited later by even me was because after that I shifted my work not to do so much photo reactions as you see in that title. It's a photo reactor. It is to make reactions happen. Now, most of the time, I'm just looking at a molecule and touching it very gently, like a proton for indicator and so on. So therefore, I did not use it. And because it's in a small journal, I suppose, it did not get quoted by anyone else either. But I wanted to show you that as we discuss how to write a paper, sometimes we are writing the paper out of sheer happiness, out of having achieved local, like local solutions to a local problem. And we are, of course, offering it now for anyone in the world who has a similar limitation. But now, please, Nimasha, can you go back to the list of points, the main slide we had, please? Huh? So then I can start to discuss what Mevan mentioned, just the main slide. Thank you. Thank you. So in a write-up, and this again was a lesson I learned in Colombo. And again, I must mention, in the library, we had a librarian called Sunil, who was extremely helpful. When we needed a publication, a new publication, he would write to the University of Sydney in Australia and get us photocopies from there. And it was uh, using UNESCO coupons. So no money involved. We just get those coupons and Sunil sends it off. Two weeks later, we get a photocopy. And that's how we started. And then we learned something which now is called the web of knowledge or the web of science. That started a long time ago in the 1980s, and I feel very fortunate to have done research at that time. When I was back in the University of Colombo doing little bits of research, which turned out to be really critical for me and for lots of other people in the fields of information handling now, I think I was helped greatly by the beginnings of Web of Science. Because the person who started the Web of Science He's called Eugene Garfield out of Philadelphia. He started writing small stories about what he thinks is important in papers. And that is what we are discussing now. And that guy had the vision to talk about things, these things in 1980. 1980, 40 years ago. And the guy said these things. And some of the things I'm telling you now are from him. So web of science, huh? web of knowledge, this is how they started. What they said is science writing is like 
general writing for the public. What is general writing for the public? Newspapers. So now website design, you could say. But then it was a newspaper and you take it from a newspaper. So if you pick up a newspaper, what do you see first? The headline, because the headline is in huge letters. So that is like on the kade, it's on the side of the road and you see in the news, something has happened. And then you go up, you pay your money, buy the newspaper. And then you read what is under the headline. And that is the leader paragraph. And after that, you get all the detail if you want to read it. So poor guys like me couldn't afford the newspaper. We just read the headline and we are happy. The lesson in it for science was pay real attention to your title. Title, title, title. So title is depends. The different journals give different lengths of title. High impact journals will limit the characters. But uh, lower impact journals will let you have long titles. And we use the full title now. If they allow us 50 characters, we will try to use the 50 characters. Again, there are exceptions. I know a friend of mine used one word titles, but he's very famous. So Nobel Prize winner can do that. But for the rest of guys like us, we use the title like in the headline of a newspaper. The title must tell the story. So that requires a lot of practice. And one of the ways I think to do that is to chat with your friends or even if you want to chat with yourself may not be a healthy thing to do, but to occasionally say the title to yourself and then you can play with the words like a song lyric and then you can adjust it, adjust it and then you can pick a title. So for example, again to give you that example from Dayasiri Rupa Singh's paper, I am really glad now that at the time we said a new class of pH indicators. It was clearly saying, okay, some people might say it's boasting, but we support the boast with our story. It's a new class. It is not a new one. It is a new class. And then we are saying what the new class is. So if you can do that, the title might attract some people, especially journal editors. Like they are, the editors are looking to make their journal more powerful, meaning more read. So if new class things are published in there, they will like it. Of course, you have to support new class. If you just say new class and inside your paper, it is old stuff, the referees will knock you down. They will criticize you. But then you can choose the title. So this is again goes back to Mevan, what you said about the story. If you have a good story, again, I take you back to childhood or take all of us back to childhood. Remember when you're sitting with your grandfather and you're saying, tell that story again. And you will say what the story so, for example, maybe you would have said, say how Mahadana Mutta did one of those, one of his tales, for example. And that is the title. So, in that way, you specify what that guy did. I think those Mahadana Mutta stories are brilliant because they are conceptual stories. How do I save the goat? How he's got his neck stuck in the clay pot. And okay, and you can learn from it. And the same thing goes with the abstract. The abstract is the leader paragraph in a newspaper. You take a longer version. Again, different journals, journals will have different lengths. Those chemical communications, the ones I showed you, the abstract has to be one sentence. So it's a real discipline to write your story in one sentence. And now many journal houses will tell that. Do your story in that abstract line. And several editors of these high impact journals have told me this person. They have no time to read all the papers that come to their desks. So they look at the title and they quickly look at the abstract. And then again, as you very kindly put in point number six, the cover letter. Those are maybe the only things they will read. The cover letter, they will skim quickly because you will write a paragraph, especially for high impact journals. We have to justify why we are sending the paper to them. So then you have to say, here is my conceptual advance. And if you can specify the conceptual advance, so like I showed you that in that Dayasir Rupa Singh's case, so in that Salia's case, it was again clear. We were saying, here is a crown ether. We are going to make it do fluorescent signaling. And that was for the first, first time. And so when we did that, the editors will notice. So that way you can build up the appeal of a paper with the title, 
with the abstract and with the cover letter. The rest of the paper is the detail of your paper. And now you can tell the story with the beginning and the end and the middle. Yes, sir. Sir, so, uh, you rightly uh, addressed the point of uh, receiving attention of the editor through a uh, uh, title abstract. And if I may add, how about the TOC graphic? Thank you for reminding me. That is a very important thing which I missed. And by that, you can see how old I am. Because for old guys, we did not have a table of contents graphic. There was a table of contents. And if I may add, that is how Web of Science started they sold tables of contents. That's all they did. They go to a journal house and ask them for their newest table of contents, which are just in words. Then they go to another journal house and get their journals. And they put all these pages together, literally into a small book. And they sold it. That was the start of Web of Science. Yes. And when doing that, this guy, Eugene Garfield, saw how people will only look at the title then, because that's all that is in the table of contents. And then if they want the paper, they will go to the paper. So you are very right to address this question of the table of contents graphic, because the table of contents graphic is a fairly recent innovation. In chemistry, it started with Anger Want the Chemie, the big journal, the high impact journal, maybe about 14 or so now, from the German Chemical Society. Uh, and so they did this and their editor at the time was very far-sighted. He realized that when people look at a newspaper or a magazine, they prefer to see a magazine with pictures. And so he started putting a picture on the cover. That is how he started. He put a picture on the cover. Most chemistry journals before that, which were in paper form, were very boring. The cover was just brown or just that and no characters, no feature to attract people. And then he realized, ah, I can put the same pictures into the table of contents page. And you are very right, Mehman, to say, now creativity must be focused on that also. And that again comes through the story. If you have a good story, then if you can summarize it into a few sentences, then you should be able to summarize it into a picture story. Like, as you know, many people who do discussion, they do a picture board. They will take like a whiteboard and draw little stick people and all over the picture, all over the board. And then you can combine it together like a film director. And so it's our chance to be like Spielberg and you make your story. And then with the technical skills that all of you have now, which I don't. And then that gets converted into a table of contents graphic. It is very important now. I agree very much. Uh, sir, so when it comes to uh, the, the, the submission process and then uh, selecting reviewers for the manuscript and also later on uh, addressing uh, the, revision, the reviewers' comments, what's your advice on that? Uh, again, you're very right to remind me of that. Uh, when we send a paper, it initially goes to the editors and uh, many journals will do that now. They will reject at the editing stage. So the editors just in the morning when they start work, they put all the titles up on a screen and they go around the table and they say, I like this. I don't like this. I like this. So it's very much picking the fashions, especially the higher impact ones. When we go up higher and higher, then they select it for fashion. So fashion means the current directions of the field. So uh, fashion has a nice meaning there, I think. So of course, then if we can form that current direction, then it's even better if we can show here is the growth of the current work. So this is the new fashion. So if we can do that, then we can be very fortunate. And at the editor stage, then that selection will be made. Uh, but as you say, then if the editor chooses your paper, then what about selecting the referees? Because that is a very important function. Uh, again, many journal houses now, the people who publish, uh, have streamlined their procedures. So now many journal houses will first take your paper 
at the editor stage and they will choose whether to continue or not. And many of them won't even give a reason. They will just say, we don't like this. Uh, so it's tough sometimes. Uh, in the older days, it was not like that. It would go to the editor and the editor would directly send to reference. The, there was no selection at the editor stage. But now, because there are so many publications coming around the world, which is a good thing, of course, now there are many more journals as well. Uh, and so because of that, the editing stage was not there before. The editing came much later. So now there's this editorial rejection. So to get through that stage, you need the title, the abstract, and the cover letter. That's it mainly. But for the referees now, we have to also choose referees now. In the past, the referees were chosen by the publishing house. And they used to make terrible mistakes at times. Because people offer themselves as referees to boost their reputation. And so they may be offering themselves for the wrong reason. They may not actually be expert in the area. Now journal houses are clearer. They will build databases themselves, but they will take it from the published literature. So they will look, Mevan Disanayaka has published in environmental organic chemistry, then they will take you as referee there. But in general now, journal houses allow you, me, as authors to also propose referees. Uh, the proposed referees are not always taken, but in general practice, they take a few. Most journal houses will ask you to send five or six now, five or six people, and then they might choose one or two, and then they might also choose from their own databases. And so because of that, then the question comes, how do we choose these referees? The way to do it is again from your story. In your story, you had the beginning of the story, the introduction, setting the scene, of how your field has come to the current point in time. So then you're going to be, say, be saying, once upon a time, there lived a little prince. Ne? We are going to say that and there was a princess and so on. So the once upon a time, you have to describe what happened before in a one paragraph usually. So in that paragraph, we will be quoting different people. We will be citing different papers, which we think from the direction until now. Those are the names of those papers. You have to carefully choose the corresponding author from those papers and then make a list of those people. And then also, of course, there is the benefit that if the paper goes for referring to one of those people, they will be at least a little happy to see themselves being quoted. So if I wrote a paper in environmental organic chemistry, and if I mentioned Mevan Disanayaka Journal of Organic Chemistry, then if you are chosen as the referee, even though I can't see you, you will have a smile on your face. You will say, ah, somebody thought of me, this guy Di Silva thinks my work is worth. So, of course, it's like a small bribe, but it's okay. In science, we need a recognition, and that is recognition. So it's a very good idea usually to take your introduction paragraph and choose some of the people who inspired you to do your work. So they are working in your field, but not working on the same problem as you. And this is quite important. You mentioned that, Mevan, because there will be some people in your field who are working on the specific problem that you are working. So those people might be a little dangerous because they might feel, uh -uh, this guy is trying to come from behind me. I must not support the guy or kill the guy. So, so then many journal houses will allow you that now. You can quote people's names and emails and institutions and you can say, please, please don't use them as reference. But some of the journal editors are really bad. A couple of them have told me they deliberately send your paper to one or two of those. But it is just to get that opinion. So they send it to them, but they mark it as a case where you specifically told them not to send. So if they write back and 
annoy you and say really bad comments and insult your family and everything else. No, just joking. And so if you do that, then the editor knows, yeah, they were right. We should not have sent to this person. This person is writing it from a biased position. So then they use it for guidance also. But it's uh, nowadays, I think many journal houses try really hard to do this. So they choose a few of the people you said, a few of the people from your introduction, some of them may be the same. And then they mix it with a couple of people from them. And then hopefully you will get a balanced view. Because this is again a powerful thing in science, I think now, peer review. Peer review because it genuinely peer. So we are all equal in science. Just because I'm an old guy doesn't mean I am better than you because you are creative too and you will be making a discovery which as an old guy, all I might be able to say quietly to myself is I am so old but I missed it. So science tries to even that out. Okay, sometimes the old guys will have a big reputation and they might apply pressures of different kinds. But that is why many journal houses will send your paper out to three reference. In the high impact ones, they will try at least that to make their minds up. Because then you are able to get a balanced opinion of what your paper represents. So as an editor, they can then make that judgment. And then Mevan, you were very right to say, how we deal with it subsequently. Again, I was told this by a, a journal editor who I'm very fond of. He told me never reply to the referees immediately. I have made that mistake myself and with very bad results. What he indicated was, of course, some of the referees will not like your work. They may not like it for selfish reasons, but in, if so, you will naturally feel annoyed and you might feel a bit angry and say a few bad words to yourself. But you must not send that to the referee straight away because then you are writing emotionally and you have not given enough time to reach a stable verdict as a judge. So you must take time, even though it's your own work. So it's like somebody else has insulted your family. Of course, the paper is your family. It's your baby, which you have constructed. And somebody is saying it's really ugly. And as you know, to every mother, her child is very beautiful. And so we can't immediately then hit that other guy. And so one of, this was a very important lesson, which is receive the referees reports and give them the benefit of the doubt. So you have to be like a, a very religious person for a moment. You must be, even though they are saying your paper is rubbish, you must not be annoyed and reply straight away. Of course, some of them will be saying it's rubbish because they think you are a, you are a competitor. So what you have to do is reply logically, point by point. Of course, the journal houses will say it also. They will say, send us your reply point by point. So you take what the referee has written, divide it up into individual sentences, and then put your reply under each sentence, under each sentence. And it's a very good practice now. You can reply straight away. You can type up an answer, but don't send it. Don't send it. Keep it for yourself because you may feel your writing really from your heart. But the next day, sleep, wake up again, talk with your friends, and discuss with as many people in your uh, co-author list as you can. And then when you have cooled down really well, then it's a good chance. Then you can give this point by point answer. And certainly over my, I suppose, many years, I have seen this many papers which were refused. Then on rebuttal, when we argue again, we slowly get them accepted. Or even if they were not accepted, like even not so long ago, if I may show a paper again, Nimasha, there is a Nimal Gunaratna, Nature Communications. The next one. Or, oh, oh, okay, maybe wait on this slide for a moment, will you? Thanks, Nimasha. Just wait for this one. Uh, uh, then maybe the next one. It's the next one. Nature Communications. Yeah, this one. Uh, this paper was from just uh, 2019 with Nimal Gunaratna. He also taught 
at the University of Colombo and was a student there. And he's in Queens, Belfast now, um, in a separate group entirely. This paper, I, I have to confess, this paper was rejected, if I remember right, five or six times from different journal houses, but different ones, different ones. We, we were sure or we felt sure at the time that this must go into a high impact journal. So we tried all the high impact ones and fail, 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 fail. And then finally, Nature Communications took it. So it is again one of these illustrations how rejection is part of science publication. Rejection is a hard thing for all of us to take. I still, when a paper is rejected, I cry for a bit and then think really hard. Why didn't I tell the story better? So this is again going back to telling a story. So if we have told the story enough times to ourselves and with our friends and thought about it again and again and again, then we can sharpen the story. And if you have a sharpened story now here, as you see from the title here, Again, thanks to Nimasha for showing the title part as well. Now, in the title part, you see, it's a bit of a long title. But in Nature Communications, they love a long title. So we used the number of characters they gave us. So, for example, in this one, the key part might be the beginning, molecular memory. So it's a bit like memory that we have. Memory that we have. We think it's a very human thing, but now we know a hard drive can have it, a USB drive can have it, and molecules can have it too. So here is a molecule which remembers. And then if you see the word directly below molecular is processing and the word in front of it is logic processing. So this is where we are combining memory with processing like happens in your computer or in your phone. And Nimasha, can you go back to maybe two papers? Go back, please. And that's Nimal Gunaratna, ah, this one. Maybe it's important to show you this also. This was the paper which started a field, a field. So molecular logic based computation. Over a thousand labs in the world do this now. So this is to show what we discussed at the beginning, how molecules can think like us or think like ourselves each think also. But this started the idea, which is now practiced by a lot of people, and synthetic biology is using this a lot now in the biggest labs. You'll find them in Harvard, you'll find them in Stanford, you'll find them in scripts and like that. Uh, this was the idea. So Nimal and me and Colin McCoy, he's a professor of pharmacy in our university now. So this is in nature at the time, which was a very impact, high impact journal then, and still is very high impact journal. But again, we went there because I didn't know. And again, this person who is like a big brother to me who later got a Nobel Prize, he's the one who told me, AP, send that to nature because nature don't publish enough chemistry. At that time, chemistry papers were not published in that journal. They mostly had uh, structural biology things like X-ray structures or proteins and things. And so we just innocently, we didn't know, we just put our ideas together and because of the encouragement from this person, and he's called Fraser Stoddart, he got the Nobel Prize in 2016. And so he encouraged me. And at that time, he didn't have a paper in Nature. So he told me, AP, you send it. You send it. And the following year, he had one. And so that was fine. And then after that, he had many more. This is the only one I've had since. But I've tried many times, but only this one. But again, to show you. Now, here is again a case of a title. And the title is immediately saying, here is a molecular AND gate. And AND gates are what computer science people use. And it's inside your phone. And how we think users AND logic and uh, Googling users AND logic. And, and these were done with molecules. And so some of the molecules are on this page. And you'll see, I'm sure many of you will see, again, you see those three benzene rings together, anthracene, and a crown ether. So the ideas go back to University of Colombo. Huh? And maybe I must specially say also, in University of Colombo, the big advantage at that time, even though University of Colombo, many of us might feel was a small place, smallness can be a huge advantage if you want to marry concepts. Because then the Department of Chemistry is quite small, the Department of Physics is quite small, and we are friends. We know each other, we play 
together in the grounds in the evening. And so one of my physics friends, Satish Namasiva, he is now in the University of Moroto. He is the one who taught me about logic games for fun. He would take me to the lab and show me, here, Epi, this is a logic game. And I'm just saying, oh yeah, I don't know. And so I learn a bit for physics, but he showed me the practical parts of it. And so it took me some time to slowly think, heming, heming, slowly, slowly. And then finally, in Belfast, Nimal and I and Colin were able to show molecular examples. And it became a subject. So now, not a subject as big as chemistry, but it's the subject of where molecules perform information technology. So it's for biology, it's for computer science, and it comes from chemistry. So University of Colombo was crucial because if I was in Queen's University, which happens to be a bigger, but then what happens is I don't know many physics guys here. I only know chemistry guys or other people who are outside of chemistry. Physics is in another building quite far away. Whereas in Sri Lanka, Colombo, they were my neighbors and they are my real friends for a long time. And so I can discuss with them and they can discuss with me. And so this is a major part of doing conceptual advances, I think. To do conceptual advances, and if you want to collaborate in some kind of way in thinking, the best is with friends. We are just chatting as friends, and the friend will say, tell you, here's what I'm doing. And then you say, ah, I'll put this into my head and keep it for another day. And so that can be a real benefit. So thanks very much, Nimasha, for that. So then, Mevan, as you said, then when we reply to a referee, we get the chance to reply to the referee to the points that they have commented on. And again, it's nice to mention maybe with this paper, that's fine, fine. The paper you showed there, the paper went to a Nobel Prize winner at the time, which was really nice, who I was frightened of. And so I had not mentioned him as a referee at all, but it had gone to him. And then he replied and said, ah, I disagree with this part, but I agree with this part. And they kindly accepted the paper. And so then it started the field. And because it was in nature, lots of people noticed the paper. If it's us, they would not have noticed. They would have said, who's De Silva? We don't care. But they would have said, who's Gunaratna? We care. Who's McCoy? They would have cared. But at that time, that paper would not have received notice for my reputation. No. But because it went into the high impact journal, suddenly people noticed. And so that's how that field grew, grew and grew now. So that synthetic biologists use it all the time now. Yes. They do it with DNA and proteins and things, but the same concepts. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor P.B. Silva, for all uh, the information and also the experience that you have shared with us in the process of uh, like uh, crafting, like, in the process of like beginning to test uh, hypotheses and identify elements to develop a story and then eventually moving on to publish it. I think this is sort of like a very resourceful uh, discussion that uh, we have conducted today. And because of Zoom induced, uh, constraints we are compelled to wrap it up thank you very much professor it was a privilege uh, to uh, host you on this and definitely every time uh, i go every time where i feel like i need to be more persistent about what i'm doing like some of your talks on youtube have been my greatest motivator so thank you, very much. thank you very much for being such a wonderful scientist, like not just contributing through inventions, but also serving as a resource person, sharing knowledge and also motivating another generation of young scientists. We had attendance of over 90 people and it's a testament to, uh, the, to your value to Sri Lankan scientists. Well, thank you very much. I think in general, just to say in passing, thanks to everybody who joined and thanks to anybody else who cares to notice these things later when they are recorded and uploaded, because these are just ideas of, a, I suppose, a very old person now who's collected together all the experiences over a while. And as you know, in Sri Lanka, we do value that the experience that comes with old age and I think, therefore, it's a real pleasure to share it with the next generations, maybe two generations. And so good luck to all of you with your scientific en endeavors and futures. Rishri, I think you're muted. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yes, we can. Oh, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Professor. It was like a great pleasure to have you here today. And uh, you're one of the most humble, uh, most humble people I've met. And uh, uh, so much of knowledge and experience. And thank you so much for sharing uh, um, everything with us today. Um, so to wrap it up, I would like to quickly uh, let everyone know, uh, please keep connected with Slake as we intend to uh, take this webinar series forward. Um, you can connect with us through uh, social media and also through the emails and we will email all of you, uh, the people who uh, um, included the emails in the chat box. We will reach out to you once uh, this webinar is ready to publish on YouTube and also on social media. Um, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time. Um, once again, thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Same for me. Thank you.